So I think we can get started now that we've given a few minutes to settle in. Um, so for today, I first wanted to start by introducing the Empatico team. Um, I'm Veronica. I'm a program associate here at Empatico. I help out with content and programs like our fellowships. I know a few of you have been in those, so shout out to all of you. Um, and I'm really passionate about leveraging research and research findings into practical matters, whether that would be content and programs that we design here at Empatico or some of the well-being practices that we'll discuss here today. So I'm really thrilled to have you all here. With me, we also have Noah and Eliana. They've been key to bringing empathy hours to life. Um, just a little bit of background on them. Noah was a classroom teacher for seven years, four as an English teacher in Madrid, three years as a middle school teacher um, in New York. And after that, he spent some time with Tiny Bop and then joined the Empatico marketing and comm scene two years ago. Also, fun fact, he's the face behind all our social accounts. So if you ever get retweeted by Empatico and all that fun stuff, that's Noah. Um, Eliana is our partnership associate here at Empatico. Before joining us, she was an English teacher in Argentina, and she worked on a number of projects to bring authentic cultural experiences into the classroom. So um, she's pursuing that mission and that work here at Empatico as well through our partnerships teams. And of course, we have our wonderful co-host, Wendy. Shout out to Wendy here. Um, she is an SEL expert and advocate and leader. Um, so we're really lucky to have her with us today to bring her expertise and share her knowledge with us. Um, Wendy, do you want to say a few words before we get started? Sure. Um, I just want to say hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I do teach second grade in Wilmington, Delaware. I've been a teacher. I'm in my 10th year of teaching. And I've been working with Empatico for almost two years now. Um, I have connected my classroom with several different classrooms around the world. Um, and that's been a transformative experience. I want to give a shout out to Alawash and my partner uh, and friend in Nigeria. I've also done some fellowships with Empatico, one with the NEA Foundation. Shout out to all my NEA Foundation friends who are here tonight, and also with Participate Learning. So I'm thrilled to be here, and um, hopefully we're going to share some great resources and strategies with everyone tonight during this difficult time. It's awesome. Uh, shout out in there. So good. keep it coming in the chat, guys. Um, so, you know, I wanted to start with a little bit of context of why we're here today. Obviously, the last few weeks have been a whirlwind, to say the least. The situation has escalated quickly and this has led to, you know, school closure, distance learning, working from home, business closures, but also a lot of acts of kindness, community connections, like the clapping you might have heard in the background in New York at 7 p.m. And during these uncertain times and also isolating times, it is easy to feel overwhelmed, alone or disconnected. So we felt that now more than ever, it is important to keep empathy, connection and community at the forefront. So as an organization, we want to create a space where educators, parents, caregivers can share their experiences, express their emotions, gain practical knowledge for maintaining their well-being and dealing with these crazy circumstances and extend their support to one another. Ultimately, empathy hours are designed to foster community, practice empathy, support each other, speak openly and honestly as long as you're comfortable and learn to learn and unpack different topics together. Our aim is to have these empathy hours occur every two to three weeks so that we can gather and learn around different topics and how they relate to the current events um, together. So if you're interested in learning more, or you have a topic you'd like to learn about, just let us know. For tonight, though, we have three objectives. We'll be focused around the relationship between social emotional learning and well-being. Particularly, we'll aim to understand SEL and how to meaningfully engage in SEL competencies during COVID-19 reflect on how we can improve well-being during these challenging times, and explore strategies that leverage these SEL skills to support our well-being. With this in mind, though, I think it's important to highlight why it's important to, for us to focus on our well-being. The current circumstances can evoke a lot of emotions and thoughts in ourselves, as we have seen. Um, and taking care of ourselves not only benefits us personally, but it also affects those around us. Um, first and foremost, it has impacts on our health. Happier people tend to have stronger immunity, can sleep better, which are all important right now, especially as we try to stay healthy. It also impacts the well-being of those around us, and there's some studies that suggest it might even impact the health of those around us. Um, if you're quarantined with 
family members, a significant other, a friend or whatnot, you'd notice that when you're in a good mood, when you feel like you're in a good place, despite those ups and downs and those normal emotions, you might be able to support um, your companion um, better during those times. It also helps us bond with others. Again, when we are in a good place ourselves or we're able to manage and recognize, cope all the emotions we're feeling, we're able to build fruitful relationships despite any emotions that we're feeling, perhaps even more so because of those emotions that we're feeling um, and healthily processing. And it also helps us engage with social issues. When we are healthy and happy, we can really take into account the needs and how we can contribute to making others or helping others be well as well. So I'll turn over to Wendy so that she can um, dive deeper into how SCL can support our well-being. Okay, right, thanks so much, Veronica. So um, I think about social emotional learning or SEL all the time. I do believe it's one of the most important topics in education right now. And um, so that said, I do know a lot. I do uh, write about it, present about it. I train on it. Um, but I don't have every answer. So as we go through our journey tonight, if there's something that you would like to know or a question that you have and we don't know it, we'll get back to you. We'll give you that commitment. Um, I think that... Um, a lot of what you're going to see I use regularly in my presentations, and um, I want to help you understand what exactly SEL is, because a lot of people say, SEL, what is it? It's soft skills, or it's, it's this block of learning that I need time for that I don't know how to do, or it's a binder of lessons. And I want to give you a really concrete understanding um, of SEL tonight, so I'm going to use some really well, uh, widely accepted um, ideas about it from Castle. So you can go ahead to the next slide, Veronica. Oh, but first, okay, first before we do that. As an educator, um, sometimes there are things that stop me cold in my tracks, okay? And this was one of them. This tweet stopped me cold in my tracks over uh, about two weeks ago, and I wanted to bring this in tonight. It says, uh, you are not working from home. You are at your home during a crisis trying to work. And the person who tweeted this said, I've heard this twice today. It's worth emphasizing. I want to say that again. We did not all decide to work from home suddenly, right? We did not all decide to homeschool our children suddenly. We have to stay at home because we're in the middle of a global emergency. So if we really think about that and take that into consideration, that's going to make uh, things seem a little different, a little more urgent, a little more challenging, and very stressful, to be quite honest. So I want to keep that context at the front of what we're doing. We're doing um, what we have to do out of necessity. I think someone commented in the chat box, what we're doing is like trying to build a plane while we're flying. That's exactly what we're trying to do. And I can tell you that the Empatico team and I met earlier before the call, we were trying to figure out all the Zoom features because all of a sudden everyone has to be an expert on Zoom to do their regular job. So um, I think keeping this idea at the forefront of what's going on is, is important for us. Okay. All right, go ahead. All right, so this is what um, I want to share with you tonight. This is um, a visual of social emotional competencies. There are five of them. And this comes from um, the organization called CASEL. And CASEL stands for the Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning. It's a not for profit agency in Chicago. And this is a widely accepted framework for social emotional learning. And the five competencies that we're going to dive into deeper tonight are self awareness, self management, social awareness relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. And this graphic comes right off their website. And if you want to learn more, you can go to Castle's website. It's um, www.castle.org. And they've got more information and videos that go with each of the competencies. So um, I have this image is burned into my brain, and I know the competencies by heart because I think about them all the time. And we're going to look at each one um, a little more in depth tonight and then talk about what it looks like, feels like, and sounds like in this age of COVID-19. So uh, you can go ahead. All right, the first one we're going to talk about is self-awareness. And I'm just going to read this definition here. This comes from Castle. Self-awareness is to accurately recognize one's emotions and thoughts and their influence on behavior. This includes accurately assessing one's strengths and limitations and possessing a well-grounded sense of confidence and optimism. So the big ideas here, I think, are understanding yourself, OK? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? What are your strengths and weaknesses? What are you able to do when things are hard? And then if you struggle, what do you do when that struggle occurs? So getting into this competency is kind of like having a hard conversation with yourself and saying, yeah, I'm, I'm good at these things, but I'm really not so good at these things, um, these other things, and that might make things hard right now. So I put those three graphics there on that slide. 
Um, I think it's um, important to have intention around this. Okay. So you can resolve or say, I'm going to face whatever comes today with a positive attitude. You can say that when you get up in the morning and we can say that when we walk into a classroom and then we know that that could all change very quickly. But intention does matter, I believe. Um, and that's something that we can practice. And if we bring that into um, our thought uh, process on a regular basis, I think it will help. Um, when you go through your day, you want to uh, reflect when you get to the end of it and say, what was something positive that happened today, even on the worst of days? And um, I'll tell you right now that in my family, we have two teenagers and teenagers are taking all of this very hard because their friends and their social life is everything. So we're on a roller coaster all the time. The mood's going up and down. But a practice that we have is that when we come together for dinner, we just go around the dinner table and everyone shares something that went well or something that they're grateful for during the day, even on the very worst day. So it might be something like, I'm grateful that um, we have a dog named Bella. Like that might be the only thing somebody can come up with. Or my daughter said the other day, I'm grateful I'm on spring break. She's been doing her online learning and she was just happy to have that pause. So um, even when things are tough, if you bring those positive emotions and positive thoughts up to the surface, it can really help. And then the third box there on that um, slide says, every day is a new beginning. Take a deep breath, smile and start again. So when we find ourselves in those tough moments um, or those difficult days, we just say, okay, I'm going to breathe. I'm going to start over again tomorrow or an hour from now or a minute from now. So knowing that we might um, kind of go up and down through these different stages as we are uh, trying to live in a self-aware state around everything that's going on. And I think with COVID-19, our ups and downs are uh, more frequent and they're more intense. All right, and go to the next one. All right, the next competency to talk about is self-management. And this is all about regulating emotions. And it's something that we work on in schools a lot. We wanna give our, um, our kids and our, our children um, language around the brain and around emotions. So um, this relates to regulating your emotions, thoughts, and behaviors effectively in different situations. It includes managing stress, controlling impulses, motivating, your, motivating oneself, and setting and working towards achieving personal and academic goals. So big ideas here, identifying your emotions and noticing your stress level. I like to use I feel statements. I feel stressed right now, so I cannot help you with your homework. I feel overwhelmed right now, so I'm going to need a minute. By um, just engaging in I statements, I feel statements, you're bringing those emotions to the surface and you're sharing them with the people that you're with. And in a classroom, that's our learners. In an online learning environment, that, that's our learners as well. And when we're all at home, that's the people that we live with, our families. Um, managing emotions is key here, knowing your triggers and having responses ready. So we don't want to say, I'm, I'm never going to have a, a difficult emotion. I'm going to stay positive and happy all the time. It's just not going to happen. But we want to know um, what we will do when the difficult emotions um, pop up to the surface. So I'll just tell you a little story, like I mentioned. We have two teenagers. We have some, we've had some great days uh, during quarantine and also some difficult days. And I have worked on self-management um, enormously over the last two years. And I think it's important because if you don't stay calm in a classroom, especially when you're working with small children, it's um, things will go south very quickly. So I've gotten a lot better at managing my emotions and staying regulated. At the beginning of this whole quarantine thing, I think I was focusing on this um, idealized version of, my, of our family. We're going we're gonna to play Scrabble going to go on these great walks and we're going to like I'll be writing in our gratitude journals it's going to be great we're going to get through this well we were going on I think my son reminded us maybe our third or fourth family walk one day in our neighborhood and the kids were just not feeling it they were really mad and they didn't want to do it and we got into it and I actually um, called my kids ungrateful jerks okay and I think my husband even looked and turned around at me and was like who are you but I just lost it I didn't um, manage myself my difficult emotions my disappointment about how people were acting when we were going these walks came up to the surface and it just popped out so the walk was a little uncomfortable for a while but what I always do is I always repair and legit apologize so literally within 30 minutes I apologized to the kids and told them that I was just upset and this was a hard time. And they're like, we got it, mom, we got it. So um, again, when the emotions come, feel them, let them happen. And if you need to repair or apologize or take a minute, um, and that's part of the management process. All right, you can go on. I think this is a great slide here. Um, as you work to manage things, you can take an inventory of what you can control and what you can't control. And then leave those things that you can't control outside if possible. 
So um, I look at this graphic. One of the things I can control and that's really helped me um, over the last few weeks is how much I um, take in news. So I've just kind of created a routine for myself where I check the news in the morning and then I check it in the evening after dinner before I go to bed to get kind of updates on what's going on. I literally don't turn it on during the day. And that's so I can stay focused on my work, which is, you know, attempting or engaging in online learning with second graders and also my family. Um, so I think if you look at this list, it's a good idea to take stock of, you know, what can I um, control and what can I not control? And then picking a couple things to work on. Also social media. Social media is a great way to keep us all connected, but then sometimes messages come into social media that you can't control or you might see too many um, of certain kinds of messages and they can literally cause stress um, and anxiety. Um, one side note too, I have not created all these graphics. A lot of what we're sharing has just come into my vision over the past few weeks. And I'm sure it's the same with you guys from group chats, from text messages from friends, from Twitter and from Facebook. So this is just one that came to me along the way that really I kind of stopped and said, yeah, this is a really good one. So. All right, go ahead. This is another one that I think is important. So along with saying that, you know, we're not gonna, we're not going to pretend it's like rosy great days um, all the time. We have to be okay with grieving the loss of things, right? And this uh, graphic talks about canceled trip, baby shower, graduation ceremonies. I think of all the kids at transition points in education. I think of eighth graders high school seniors and college seniors and what they're having to put on hold right now. And it's just enormous. Um, my daughter said to us, I'm lucky I'm only a freshman because I know how hard it must be for the older kids. Your child's birthday party, your freedom, everything, your, your, your workout routine, your coffee with friends. Um, I have to tell you that I'm turning 50 on Thursday and it's my birthday. And this birthday celebration is going to look a lot different than we thought it would would be. And we have a family trip planned in July and we may not even be able to go on that. But I have to reframe a little and say, um, we're all healthy. We have what we need and we're safe. So that's a very nice place to be as I hit this kind of big milestone birthday. So guys, it's okay to grieve. It's okay to say, yeah, this, this really stinks and, and then figure out a way to move forward. Or uh, another way to reframe it is to say, I have something to look forward to in the future. Okay. So the next competency we're going to talk about is social awareness. This is the ability to take the perspective of and empathize with others from diverse backgrounds and cultures, to understand social and ethical norms for behavior, and to recognize family, school, and community resources and supports. So the big idea here is just empathy. It's all about empathy. And I believe it's uh, empathy for the people that you live with. It's the people that you serve, um, your students and your community. It's empathy for everyone. And I, I just would go back to that idea of grace and compassion right now. Grace and compassion are what we need so much right now because everyone's riding the same roller coaster that we are. And um, empathy um, will help us get through this. So you want to think to yourself, and this is in your home or in your learning space, how are people feeling? Ask. Just ask. Um, what do they need? And how can I help them? That includes your uh, family, your students and their families, your um School leadership, I've been trying to be particularly empathetic to our administrators right now because sometimes teachers get frustrated because we don't know what's happening, when it's going to happen or how it's going to happen, but neither do they. And I believe that goes all the way up to district and state levels of educational leadership right now. We're, we're building the plane as we fly it. So being empathetic to your leadership and your community is um, a really um, smart thing to do. So I love this little graphic. Empathy is seeing with the eyes of another listening with the ears of another and feeling with the heart of another. I think that last one, feeling with the heart of another, um, is so important. I know I've seen it with my kids, like, wow, man, my son is so mean to me, but what that means is that he's hurting about something and I need to give him some space and be empathetic to him. Um, two things in my life have helped me understand empathy in a very deep way. Um, one has been my connection with my uh, friend Alawashin in Nigeria and, and learning about education in all different parts of the world. And the other one is being a parent of teenagers. Let's put it all into perspective. So I am really working on trying to be as empathetic as possible these days. Go ahead. So I love this slide. This is just one of my best teacher besties sent this to me. Um, this talks about the reaction to the current situation of introverts versus extroverts. And it really made me think about my family. We have a family of four. My uh, son and I are extroverts and my husband and daughter are more introverts. So my son is really, really struggling. He's a very social kid and um, he's just having a hard time. And I am too. I've kind of become this person that schedules at least like six Zooms with friends a week. But I'm like, if that's what I can do, I'll do it. So even take inventory of 
uh, your family or the kids you're working with? Are they introverts and extroverts? And think about how each of them might be feeling in the situation. And of course, a slide like this or a meme like this just makes you laugh. So be thankful for whoever put that one out there. <laughs> All right, social awareness during COVID-19. So I think a lot about the community. There's so many needs in the community. There's so many heroes. Allison, you mentioned your daughter is a nurse. Um, nurse uh, nurses and doctors, first responders. Um, let's think about everyone who is working in grocery stores and delivering packages. There are so many heroes out there. How do you feed that community? Can you give to your local food bank? Um, how can you help, basically? This slide um, I had seen before the whole quarantine situation came up, but I just thought it was really... Um, a nice one that helped me to think about the different ways I can support my community. And then I'm focusing on two of them. Um, the ones that really resonate with me are connecting. So connecting um, my kids in my classroom and my families together. And even if what we're doing tonight, I would call educating. Okay, so we're bringing together a group of people, educating um, people around social emotional learning and strategies um, to help get through this very difficult time. So that's a great one that you can look at and say, yeah, that, you know, that one really resonates with me. I can work on this in um, supporting the people around me at, outward to the community. All right. And then, okay, a couple more tweets that really resonated with me. Uh, I'm gonna read the one on the left. And I'm just sorry, I gotta put on my glasses here for a minute. It's not that parents don't care or are being difficult. They might be working. They might be looking for work. They might be able to think of better things for their kids to do than worksheet 17. They might be struggling with their own mental health. They might have the virus. So I've just seen a lot of things like that. You know, teachers were charged with, okay, get your online learning up and running and then see who's logging in and see who's doing their assignments and see who's not. For the families that are doing them maybe a little more slowly than others, um, I'm just checking in and being like, hey, are you okay? The learning's up. If it takes you a few days, that's all right. We just don't know what's going on with people. We might be uh, working with families where uh, post both breadwinners are no longer working. Um, I heard a story about a single mom of three boys recently, and she has one computer. Since she's a teacher, she has to use a computer all day for online learning, so none of her boys can get on to do their online learning. So they can't get on to start their stuff until like um, later in the evening. So it's taking them longer. And I think um, we have to keep all that perspective in mind. We just don't know what people are dealing with right now. Um, the tweet on the right, a, a parent asked me a question about online learning and I wrote her back and she's like, I'm so sorry to bother you. And I said, oh my gosh, no, every parent deserves an award right now because again, all these parents did not decide to homeschool their children. They had to have their parents doing school at home because of a global emergency and many of them are working. Again, out on a walk, her next door neighbors have young children, second grade and kindergarten, and the mom works full time. And she just said, it's so hard for me because I have to sit next to my daughter. She can't access the computer and even log in on her own to help her get through the lessons. And um, I think that was, that was uh, difficult. And I think that's fair. So a lot of people may be going through that. Um, so just wanted to um, mention that. Uh, and again, that grace and compassion will serve us really well as we go through our uh, interactions with people. All right. And then this one. OK, so this came to me in a group chat. So this is working from home as a parent. Right. So there's that tape. There's those kids on the floor. Don't you move. I've got to get my work done. But oh, they have to get their online learning done. Oh, but we're all sharing the Wi-Fi. So the Wi-Fi is slower and weaker. We're running out of devices. I mean, this is what we're dealing with. This is not an easy place to be. So um, a little a little humor helps us get through. Okay, so the next competency, the fourth one, is relationship skills. This is the ability to establish and maintain healthy and rewarding relationships with diverse individuals and groups. It includes communicating clearly, listening actively, cooperating, resisting inappropriate social pressure, negotiating conflict constructively, and seeking and offering help when it's needed. So um, I think the keys, the other competencies lead up to this, right? Because if you can engage in self-management and emotional regulation, if you have strong communication skills and empathy, then you're going to have positive relationships. So some of those other competencies are like the building blocks for this. Um, you can create new relationships, especially in this time, and leverage existing relationships for good. I'll just um, share a quick story. So it was our daughter's birthday last Thursday. She's a freshman in high school. She can be shy. Um, I think she was really looking forward to her spring sports season because it was going to help her deepen some friendships with kids. And, um, you know, all of a sudden that stopped and the, the door was shut and everything. So I, because of all my work, um, I enjoy relationships with people around the country and around the world, teachers and, and others. I've been 
less important to travel. So I just reached out on social media and I said, hey, our daughter's birthday is next Thursday. Can you make a picture, send a card, send a greeting or text it to me or email it to me and I'll print them out and cover our front door. And lo and behold, greetings and pictures and cards and notes came from everywhere. And the morning of her birthday, she walked down, there was a message from Nigeria. There were some from people she never met in California and Washington state. So I feel like I was able to leverage my existing relationships for a good purpose to help our daughter have a happier birthday. And some local moms had seen it and they got their daughters to make messages. And um, so that's just um, an idea. You know, when you get, when you're here, you're stuck in this situation, things are coming up. Like, what can I do? That was something that I could do. And um, also the communication skills, the example I gave, walking with our kids and saying something that was not very nice, just immediately apologizing and owning my um, uncomfortable emotions and, um, and apologizing for them. That, that helps keep my relationship with my family strong. All right, and go to the next one. Okay, so this is a video, and you may have seen this. Um, a celebrity put it out. And it's a positive video. I kind of tear up every time I see it. But there's so many good examples of relationships uh, being used in positive ways during this crisis in the video. So we'll just take a minute and enjoy the video. Sometimes it's hard to stay positive while we battle this unfolding crisis. People are scared right now and they're stressed and they're looking for somebody to reach out. It's bad human behavior. But we've also seen some of the best. We're mobilizing a group of volunteers to deliver groceries to elderly people that should not be out shopping on their own in these times. And if we got to you know, rise out of this, we got to do this together. The doctors and nurses who are treating coronavirus patients around the world. These medical personnel are putting their own lives at risk to help the stricken. Praise for these heroes can be heard across the globe. Instagram. And I just look at that video and I think about even celebrities using their power to reach people to share stories. He has a platform and a following on Instagram. He shared motivational stories. You saw people uh, singing happy birthday to people, buying groceries for older people. Um, what can you do with your relationships in the community to help people? And um, we need to see the good stories. That's another good thing that's coming out of all of this. And I think it's wise to say, what can I do with the relationships that I do have? And how can I make sure that the ones that I have stay strong? And how can I even create new ones? All right. So the last competency is responsible decision making. And I think this is another one where all the other competencies kind of lead up and build to what this is. So again, if you can practice self-management and self-awareness, if you can be um, empathetic and socially aware and you have good relationship skills, that should lead to responsible decision making. So it's to make constructive and respectful choices about personal behavior and social interactions based on consideration of ethical standards, safety concerns, social norms, the realistic evaluation of consequences of various actions and the well-being of self and others. So what is this all about now? This is about staying Right. And like Homa said, it's about explaining that we need to stay home and be safe so scientists can do their job and find a vaccine. So first responders and other important people can help people. So um, right here, my big idea, and I talk about this in my classroom, I have a sign up that actually says, stop 
think, decide. Just slow down when you're going through things and think about what you're doing. Um, the visuals here are about flattening the curve, how if we stay home, we're going to reduce the spread of the virus, which is what we need to do. Um, and in, the, in that context, okay, you have to stay home. You don't have a choice in that. You can't control that. But what can you do while you're home? And then we've talked about the ideas of practicing gratitude or engaging um, new hobbies or um, trying to help others that can help you while you have to stay home. And you can go to the next graphic. And yeah, this is just, I think this makes it so clear, the math behind staying home. So uh, when you go out less often, you will be exposed to fewer people. And then those people will be exposed to fewer people. And it will dramatically cut down um, the way that the virus can spread. And there's a ton of really good graphics out there about this. There's one where the match lighting and then Someone pulls a match out of a line of matches and the whole thing just stops. So this kind of makes it really clear and concrete what your job is. I know um, my son was playing in the neighborhood. Um, the first week we were home, the kids were playing like um, catch or football, just staying six feet apart. And then all the parents, we just said, no, you can't, you just, you can't even do that. So it's really, really hard. Um, but we all know that this is our big, big job right now. All right, so now we kind of want to bring it all together, and this graphic is another one that stopped me cold in my tracks, and I have a, we have a better uh, picture of it on the next slide, but this is a tweet from a nurse in the United Kingdom, okay? So she has this graphic where she talks about three zones that you can be in, and I think um, that um, this is underscores how much uh, we vacillate from one zone to another sometimes on an hourly basis, certainly on a daily basis. And she talks about the fear zone, the learning zone, and the growth zone. So you can go ahead to the next slide. It's a little bit bigger and easier to see. And this graphic, um, I saw it on Twitter. I reached out to the person who shared it. She said she got it in a group text. And then I worked with someone else to find out where it had come from. And this is incredible to me. Um, so fear zone, learning zone, and growth zone. I have a personal goal to be in the growth zone, right? And I will work very hard at that. However, there are some moments and days when I'm uh, definitely in the learning zone and there might be some times when I find myself in the fear zone, okay? Um, so just putting like very concrete ideas around each of these, um, I think it's so helpful. And one of my girlfriends, when I shared it, she said, wow, I am all over the place with this thing, like on a daily basis, in and out of the different zones. So I think as we work to manage ourselves, or for instance, if I want to be in that growth zone, noticing where we are at different times um, is extremely helpful. That's the first step, noticing where you are, because then you can engage in the work to get to where you want to be or get back to a better place. Um, so I just love this. Um, I think about others and how I can help. I mean, I think that's all of you right now. You guys are taking your own time to be here tonight to learn something new so you can better support your children and your families and students that you serve. That's, that's a growth zone move right there. Okay, I start to let go of control, realizing that, yeah, hey, I may not be able to celebrate that birthday or go on that trip or, or do what I was supposed to do, um, you know. Um, uh, that day in the walk with my kids, I acted like a victim looking who to blame. I was blaming my kids because my internal idea of what the walk was going to look like wasn't happening. What? You know, I was clearly in the fear zone during that little outburst. So um, this, is, this is a great visual to um, think about. All right, and you can go ahead. All right, so... Um, we have been talking about what habits and practices have helped us during these times. You guys are sharing a lot of great practices that you have and kind of rethinking what learning uh, looks like and what learning means. Um, so in trying to um, embrace those habits and practices, what challenges have you faced? I think just talking about some of them and noticing them is extremely, um, it's extremely helpful. We want to now give you some hopefully helpful strategies um, that can enhance your social emotional learning growth during this time. All right, so strategy number one is to be proactive, have a plan and try to stick to it, knowing that we won't always stick to the plan. This is another graphic that just, I can't remember how I saw it. I think it might've been, uh, it either came in a group chat or on Facebook. And I just love how simple this is. And a lot of um, people that I talked to have talked about how their anxiety is really ramped up these days. And I know there's kids that are young um, that are anxious as well. And all the constant news uh, coverage of what's going on. I mean, there is no other news. There's no sports events. There's nothing. Um, so I love these simple tips. Wash your hands. Reduce the time you spend in public places. That is a mandate now. Moderate your news intake. Limit exposure to online media. That's helped me personally quite a bit. 
Um, if you're working from home, create a common work environment. I go to one place that's set up and it's neat and it's functional. I know my friend Jennifer set up this almost like mini classroom at home. It's amazing. She shared a picture of that. Um, practice self-care like deep breathing or meditation. Absolutely. Sometimes I just have to stop and be still and wait until whatever is happening is passing. And don't be afraid to ask families and friends for help if you need it. That's so important. All right. Uh, one of my favorite new resources I've discovered in all of this is The Greater Good uh, coming out of the UC Berkeley. And they have a newsletter and a website, and they just send out the most amazing articles. Um, so they have a really incredible one. There's a link here in the presentation, and it says, Keep the Greater Good in Mind. Um, it's from Greater Good Magazine. It's talking about everything that you guys have just been talking about, how the explosion of kindness and helpfulness is happening. That's a really good thing to come out of this, how people can hopefully um, – reconnect as life is slowed down, all those kinds of things. So if you keep an eye out for those heroes, for those opportunities, that's really going to be helpful. Um, and when you do get the slides, there's a link to the article there. They also, uh, side note, have an incredible article called How to Help Teens Shelter in Place. If you work with teens or you're um, a parent with teens, and that's helped me enormously too. Us today, haven't we? Now we're going to get ready for that journey by getting ourselves warmed up. And we're going to start with um, our shoulders. So I love you all. Unmuted. They could um, mute themselves. Can you lift? Thank all you. right. So that uh, Greater Good has a ton of really good resources. We're going to share another one in a couple of minutes. All right. Go to the next one. Okay. So another strategy is reframing negative thoughts. And this is something that I, I work on and practice a lot. Reframing does not mean that you're going to silver lining everything and that everything is good when it's really not. It just is another way to view something. And there's a link to this article um, in psychology today, which I think makes it very easy to understand. Reframing is just saying, yeah, this is happening. Um, this is something I don't like or didn't want, but here is another way to look at it. Okay. So very simply for small children, you might say, okay, when you went out to recess today, um, the uh, soccer field was full. There were no more spots on the soccer team and you really wanted to play soccer. How could you reframe that feeling or that experience? You could say, well, I learned how to play another game. I went over to the kickball field and I learned how to play a new game and I played with other kids. Or I took some time to walk on the walking path by myself and I was able to just think and, and clear my head. So you're not going to say it's, it's okay or it's great that this didn't happen, but what's another way you can look at it to see some type of benefit, reframing um, thoughts with intention. Okay, and then empathy, strategy number four, responding with empathy. Um, again, a few experiences in my life have really taught me about um, empathy, a few roles in my life. This is an outstanding article from Understood, and that's another great resource that has lots of uh, lessons and supports around social-emotional learning. And um, this article about seven ways to respond to, it should say students or kids, your own kids, or even family members with empathy, talks about listening, um, it talks about um, letting people be where they are and not trying to push them out of it or pull them out of it or offer solutions. So I think it's, it's a really helpful resource. All right, and number five, uh, box breathing. So this is a type of deep breathing strategy. And it's something I do in my classroom, and my, my students really love it. Um, I actually have my kids trace a box in the air when they do this, but it's about slow breathing. And this method is actually used um, with, by the Navy SEALs to slow things down in high-stress situations like combat. So the idea is this: that you breathe uh, for in four-second intervals. You breathe in, you hold it, you breathe out, and you hold it again. So it's just like this. It's like one, two, three, four, hold two, three, four, out, two, three, four, and then hold. So I do that in the classroom as we transition from activity to activity. It just slows things down. And if you uh, look online, there are some GIFs and some websites that have like a, a visual that moves with that one, two, three, four counting, and they're really helpful. So if I put that up in the screen, if things are going to you know where in my classroom, and I'm like, we just need to slow down for a minute, I can put up this visual and we can do this for three or five times. It just brings everything down. So this is something you can do when you need to. All right. And so then our big question is, okay, now that we know what the five competencies are and we know what they look like and feel like and sound like in the age and era of COVID-19, how can we um, engage in some activities with our children and our students? So we have some resources here for you. And um, this again comes from the greater good. They have 
social emotional learning lessons for online learning in um, for different ages. So K to two, and that's the page that she's showing you now. And as you scroll down, you can see there's different activities that you can do. And I know that there's ways to um, bring these into the online learning environment. So um, if you're teaching children K to two, or you have kids that are the age of K to two, these are all possibilities. Then they have a page for um, grades three to five. And it's the same thing, still working on the same competencies, but doing it in a way that makes sense for this age group. And then they have middle school activities. And then there's also activities for high schoolers. So one that is kind of universal for all ages is a community circle check-in. And in this age of online learning, the way that we do this is um, we use a platform called Schoology where we have discussion posts. So I actually uh, type up the community building discussion post each for each day and then the kids comment answering the post. And then I also create a Flipgrid where they can go and record a video to share what they're posting as well. So we're able to check in with each other without being together, even without a live video call. And everyone can read everybody's responses. And kids can say pass if they don't want to. Um, Check in. Some kids who aren't comfortable making videos just post in the discussion board with words, but don't make the video. Some kids who really love um, that stage of being on video and responding to other kids' videos, Flipgrid is perfect for them. So that was, before I put together one lesson on reading or math, I was like, how am I going to do morning meeting? How am I going to have my community check in with my students every day? And this is the way we came up with it. And it's not perfect, but it is working and it does allow us to check in first before we do anything. Um, in the meantime, I thought there's these last two slides that have some great ideas of other ways to engage, um, which Wendy found. Um, this one's a really cool one. Yeah, I found that on Twitter. You can see we can actually uh, attribute it to Tamara Letter. And I actually printed it and I hung it on the door in my kitchen. And it's just staying up in that positive zone. Um, so just ideas, really simple ideas for how to... Um, engaging kindness or, or happy things. And I just, another one that just like, wow, it's so simple, but it's so powerful and, and accessible to people of all ages. This other one's from Greater Good again. Um, I told Wendy I'm obsessed with that. Her new favorite, right, yeah. Um, but it's a really great article. It's linked in the presentation if you guys want to take a moment to read it. It's six questions to ask yourself during quarantine. And one of the key things I thought, or that I personally took away from that article, is that it doesn't need to me. It doesn't. They need don't need to be big things. Like moving your body could literally mean you took a walk across your living room, and that was enough for you today. Um, it's being grateful for the little things that you can do, and not um, necessarily or re redirecting your energy toward the things you can do, and not toward the things you cannot during these circumstances. Oh, I love that. Are we going to again? Yeah, and bring back kind of like stories around these resources. That would be a really cool empathy hour, wouldn't it? Love that idea. You do too. If you do uh, try some of these out and you have stories you'd like to share, feel free to um, email us or share it on Twitter, Facebook, any method you're comfortable with. I think we'll wrap up. That, that marks our first empathy hour. Thank you all for jo joining us today. I hope um, you guys uh, found it helpful and comforting to be together during times like this. And of course, thank you to our wonderful host, Wendy. Um, if you weren't convinced by now that she's an expert, I hope you are. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. Thank you for being here, everyone. I learned so much from all of you because we are our own best source of uh, knowledge, power, and inspiration. So thanks, Empatico, for the invitation and putting it together. And a wonderful hour I feel like really heartful right now so thank you so much awesome well again everybody feel free to um, reach out to us via social media email um, whatever is helpful or most convenient to you and we're so excited to keep these going we'll probably share out more information on another empathy hour in the next couple of weeks so yes. keep an eye out bye everyone thank you, Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. nice seeing everyone bye guys <laughs>